start today because I think this will be a good way to lead into the sermon that I'll be preaching in just a little bit. But we had a unique thing that kind of happened uh, years ago when Jeremy, our second born son, turned 15. He wanted to get a dog and he had in his mind that he wanted a, a yellow lab. And so uh, we, we were looking and the price was a little spendy until we found a ranch that had uh, a bunch of pups by accident that were three-quarter three Chesapeake and one-quarter lab. And so we took a drive to the ranch, and that's where he ended up finding the dog that he fell in love with. But he drug him out from underneath a pile of railroad ties where they had kind of dug a hole, and he drug this, ho this, this one out, and he's holding his head, and he's looking at him. He's the runt of the litter. I mean, the, the ugliest dog in the whole bunch. And he's looking at his face like this. Yep. This is the one, Dad, this is the one I want right here. And that's the one we took home. So I wanted to show you, uh, show you some pictures of that. Let's see if I've got to get this going here. So uh, you got it set, Dara, for us to go? So that's uh, Jeremy at 15, and that's uh, Tyson when he was looking a whole lot better than he did uh, when we first picked him up. But you can see some of these pictures. Whoops, where did we go? And we're going the wrong direction. Which, how, how are we doing there? Can you get me Dara in the right place? So, uh, this is the Russians have somehow tapped into the Russian takeover. So, there, there we go. Okay, so. You can see this little guy, and uh, Jeremy began to work on him and love him and everything like that. Uh, Dara, just go ahead and uh, punch through those pictures. I, I'm going to let you do it. So this one doesn't seem to be working. So There's Tyson after he grew up, and uh, another one. And he was always eager and ready. Jeremy had him responsive that he was always, in fact, you could pick up a rock, throw it into a creek. That dog somehow could dive in, go to the bottom, and find the rock that you had thrown in there. Now, how they do that, I don't know. But he'd bring the exact same rock out. And here they're doing a little four buying. And uh, so, but you can see uh, that dog responded to love. And as a result, the dog's life was changed and Jeremy's life was changed. So a few years later, I wrote a poem about it. So I thought I'd start out. And this will lead into the text that we'll be looking at together. My son prepared to celebrate 10 plus five years from his birth. In the hot month of the summer, with eyes of hope, he said to me, Dad, I need a dog with golden hair to hold. We looked to count the cost, the price much higher than we thought. So we waited and we watched. And finally, the good news appeared, a mixed and multicolored bunch of Chesapeake and Labrador. So to the ranch we drove, and from the car we walked. A black one came to greet us. I stopped to shake his shiny head. While son just kept on walking, his, his heart was on a brother. Around the house we went. Another came to meet us. A chocolate with big brown eyes, in awe and admiration, kneeling. Son, look here, I said. Unbroken was his stride. In the yard of playful pups, some railroad ties were stacked. Beneath this wood, a hole was dug where little dogs could hide and sleep. My son, now on his knees, was searching through the shadows. Deep within the dungeon, dark, all alone, down in the dirt, a sad and single yellow leg. And with his hand, son reached to hold it. With a grip of grace and love, he pulled this pup into the light, a bony, scrawny, ugly mutt. Tender hand now held his head, eyes to eyes and heart to heart. Through a smile, the words were said, this is the one, Dad. This is my dog. Faithful friend, the chosen one. Listen to what God says. For God delivered us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. He pulls us out from underneath that dirt and darkness, draws him to himself, 
looks into our eyes and said, this one belongs to me. And then we are transformed by his love. And we want to celebrate that today. So worship team, why don't you all come on up and we'll, uh, we'll sing together. They're gonna, the worship team is going to let you sit on the first two and then stand on the third, third one today. Right, Vaughn? All right. So we'll, uh, I'll have a word of prayer and then we'll sing together. Uh-oh. Matthew, my firstborn son, is coming today. He hasn't played the bass in years, and so we'll see how he does today. <laughs> and he really dressed up for the occasion, you can see. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, uh, really all we can do is just express our gratitude to you and live lives of thankfulness and for your mercy and your grace. And for you dragging us to yourself and then loving us and, and changing us day by day. And so, Lord, we come today to meet with you and to sing to you and to thank you and to have grateful hearts for your great love and mercy. So be the recipient of our songs today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
stand with us please on this last song I'd like to read from Psalm 34 verses 2 and 3 my soul will make its boast in the Lord the humble will hear it and rejoice oh magnify the Lord with me let us exalt his name Bonnie's uh, mom and dad used to like to sing all the time in the car, or they would sing wherever they were. We would uh, meet them in Moses Lake sometime, and he'd bring a boat over, and they had a hot tub, and it had tile all the way around it. And I can remember sitting in that hot tub, and all of us singing that last song right there, We Exalty. We ran everybody out of there, but man, I'll tell you, we had a, it was like a sanctuary in a hot tub, so good place to be. This year will mark 25 years ago when we moved from Yakima to La Grande. And 
I didn't realize it after I told Brock I'd take this particular text and start working on it, that the first sermon that I preached at First Baptist Church downtown on December the 7th, 1997, was entitled Exalting God Alone from the same passage that we're going to be looking at together today here in 1 Corinthians. And I was trying to wrestle with the question, why does God do what he does the way he does it? And so I pulled the notes from that sermon and listened to how I started, uh, started it out. God seems to delight in using simple, ordinary, common things to display his glory. Just think about it. In the Bible, God uses some dirt, a rib, a tree, a dove, a bush, a stick, a rock, a sheep herder, a slingshot, stone, uh, a whale, a donkey, ravens, a carpenter and a teenage girl from a hick town up in the hills, a stable, a feed trough, swaddling cloth, some fishermen, a little boy with a sack lunch, a herd of hogs, some spit and mud, a colt, colt of a donkey, a whip, a crown of thorns, a rooster, a cross, some nails, and a stone that was rolled away. Those are just a few of the little things that God uses. Why does God do what he does the way he does it? Um, I believe it's because God is glorified the most when he uses common things, ordinary things, the runts from down underneath a pile of railroad ties. So uh, you might say, well, that's an unusual sermon for you to start your ministry out at a new church. 25 years ago, but the reason I did it was that um, about a year before that, before, before we kind of went through a crisis time uh, in Yakima that brought us to this valley, uh, I was on a Saturday morning uh, reading from a book that had a sermon in it by Jonathan Edwards, the first published sermon by Jonathan Edwards, who was kind of a, what some would say, the greatest theologian and the greatest uh, preacher of, of, from Amer of American history, uh, who was used by God during the days of what was called the Great Awakening, but people were so touched by the message that he preached on uh, July the 8th, 1731, almost 300 years ago now, entitled, God Glorified in Man's Dependence, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 31. So, I picked that particular uh, text based on how moved I was as I read through this old sermon and found myself weeping as I went through it. It touched my heart. And so his point was, the more we depend on God, the more we will glorify God. And he made the point that we are absolutely, totally, completely dependent upon God for our salvation. In other words... It's all of God that we get saved. So um, let's review a little bit of the lead-in to the verses that we'll be looking at. Um, so if you have your Bible, you'll want to turn 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 18, uh, Brock did a great job of unpacking these verses for us last Sunday. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, don't miss, Brock made this really clear, and he put the cross up there, whenever the cross of Christ goes, wherever it's preached in the world, it will tend to divide people into two categories, which means everybody in this room right now is in one category or the other. Either those who are perishing or those who are being saved. So, there could be somebody in here right now that's on a track of perishing is the way the word Bible describes it. Or it could be those that are being saved by the power of God. Now, it's interesting when the cross of Christ is preached, wherever Christ goes and the message of Christ goes, it divides people. Now, think about it. His birth 
divides time between B.C. and A.D. His death divides people between lost and found. And it has nothing to do with the color of your skin or what kind of language you speak or what kind of truck you drive or what kind of house you live in. Uh, it is all dependent upon how we respond to the cross of Christ, the word of the cross. And based upon that response, our eternal destiny would be determined. We're either perishing or we're being saved. Who's being saved? Well, that's found again in verse uh, 21 there as we come down through it. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So the ones that are being saved are the ones that are believing. And so it has nothing to do with what we do. It has everything to do with whom we trust, who we place our trust in. So the word of the cross is proclaimed. For those that put their trust in what Christ did on the cross and who he was and what he accomplishes on the cross, they are being saved by faith, by faith alone, not by good deeds that we might do. So, in verses 22 and 23, again, the word of the cross uh, shows different responses. Now, these two categories are of people that are very much culturally totally different from each other. But they encountered the cross and rejected it for some reason. And so what Paul unfolds is that the Jewish people were looking for miracles. They were looking for the power of God. And so they were looking for the supernatural. And when Christ came, it was not the Messiah that they expected. And as a result, they stumbled over him. They tripped over him. A stumbling stone. The Greeks... Now, think about it. We're, he's writing to the Corinthians, and Corinth was not very far from Athens, and Athens was the center of wisdom and the, the history of philosophers. So you've got uh, Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, and so the Greeks, these Gentiles of that area, they're programmed to look for wisdom. They, they want the super logical. It's got to make sense. Some divine logos that holds this universe all together and, and makes it fit together in all the parts of their worldview. When they heard the word of the cross, that somebody could come that claims to be the God-man, dies on a Roman cross, and somehow they look at that and say, that's going to save somebody for eternity and move them from perishing to eternal life? Forgiveness of sins? And their response to it was, that is the most foolish thing I've ever heard. So, of those who reject Christ and the cross of Christ, they either stumble over it or they say it just doesn't make any sense. So, in verse 24, we see uh, that there are those that are being saved have a different response. Now, notice how they're described in verse 24. But to those who are the called... They're called the called. Now, I always think of my dad calling cattle. Woo! And when he'd do that, those cows, no matter where they were, they came running because they knew there was going to be some protein cakes or hay or something that dad would be feeding them. Jesus said, my sheep, whom the Father has given to me, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I give eternal life to them. So, the called are the ones that are called to life. They're called to follow Christ. And it's uh, something that uh, they're going to respond to. So, but to those who are called, notice where they come from. Both Jews and Greeks. So, some of them, from either both of those categories, Christ has become the power of God, supernatural, and the wisdom of God, the super logical, what would you say, the wisdom that reveals the very nature of God himself that God puts on skin and Christ demonstrates the glory of what God is like and radiates the glory of God. And the cross of Christ is like the, the ultimate expression of the nature of God and the glory of God. So, 
They respond, the call or respond, those who are being saved. Now, we come to our text for the day now as we move into verse 26. These ones that are called the called are the ones that God has chosen. And so you will see how this begins to unfold. And some of these things might bring up questions in your mind. And all I can tell you is yeah, when you go into a text like this, it's like diving theologically into the deepest part of the ocean. And down below there, the pressure on your head begins. You feel it. And it's very dark. And there are some things that are secret things that are God only knows that are mysteries to us and that we can't totally figure out. But when the Bible teaches it at Homestead, we believe it. So that's what we do, verse by verse, as we go through. Uh, who are these called ones? So in verse 26, this is what it reads. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble. So let's, let's just think on that for just a minute. When God calls, what kind of people are going to be responsive primarily according to his sovereign grace? There will not be very many of them that are wise or think they're super smart. Sometimes the smartest people are the ones that have the most difficulty. There will be not many that will be mighty or strong or put their confidence in their muscle, or their athletic ability, or their brawn, or their courage. There are not many that are noble. That means uh, genetically born into royalty, so to speak, or aristocracy, or those that are upper class kind of people. Now, it doesn't say not any, it just says not many. In fact, Jonathan Edwards was a brilliant intelligent man, but God worked on his heart that it so humbled him that he was able to write a sermon that touched the hearts of many. It doesn't say that there are not many, not any, it just says there's not many. What kind of people does God choose, and why does he do what he does the way he does it? There it goes into the next verse now as we continue to track it. Consider your calling, and then in verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. He has chosen the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he might nullify the things that are. So you look at that and begin to see that. Why does God put the team together this way? You ever remember being in elementary school or something and everybody lines up and two captains are appointed and they start saying, well, I'll take this one and I'll take this one and I'll take this one and I'll take this one. And you get down to the last person, and they say, ah, uh, you can have them. There is something in the nature of God that is for that last person standing. He has chosen the foolish things. He has chosen the weak things. He's chosen the base things or those lowly things, the despised things. He's chosen the are nots, the nobodies. That's, God is for the underdog. Somehow in the nature of God, this is the kind of people he goes. He goes for the runt of the litter down in the darkness, down in the dirt, and a hand of grace and love drags it out into the light, holds him in his hands, and he says, this one belongs to me. These kind of people, I believe, ultimately glorify God. So when Jeremy chose this pup, 
And then I watched and began to work with him every day and love on that dog. That dog was transformed. You would never have known he was a runt. And uh, they had a special relationship as a result. I believe that there's something in the nature of God himself that he has chosen the runts of this world in order that he might ultimately be greater glorified by those who could not save themselves and desperately needed him. Now we come to a very important verse, and this is the verse that Jonathan Edwards spent most of his time in the sermon on. When you come uh, into it now, uh, look with me at the, at the next verse and what it says. Verse 30. Verse 30. Uh, well, I should say verse 29 first. The reason why does God do what he does? Look at what it says. What does it say right at the end of uh, verse 29? So that no man may boast before God. Runts don't have anything to boast about. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Um, your translation might say it a different way. Uh, if you're reading your Bible, it might read something like this. Because of him, or out of him, or from him, or of him, he is the source of your life in. So whatever your translation is, look at that phrase. This is critical. That's the one that of all the verses in this text, and all the phrases in the text, jumped out to Jonathan Edwards, and that's where he placed his focus. How are we saved? How do runts come into a relationship with an eternal God and enjoy him forever? It is by his doing, not our doing. It is by his doing, not our doing, that you are in Christ Jesus. Now, what is important is you have to be in Christ Jesus in order to be saved. So salvation is in him. Salvation is in the word of the cross and in the message of Christ and why he came and what he came to accomplish and do. And so being in him means you've got to be connected to him. You have to have a relationship with him. You have to have a personal, loving, intimate relationship that say that you're in him. When a person gets baptized, the water represents Christ and the death of Christ. And you go under the water and you, you are dunked in, you are immersed into it, you are saturated in it, you are in Christ, died with him, raised with him, resurrected in a new person in him, a total new creation in him. We must be in him to be saved. And being in him is not by our doing, it is by God's doing. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Listen to Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, there will be no condemnation. There will be no judgment. There will be no hell because the condemnation was taken to the cross and nailed on the cross. When Christ died, all of the sins that would have condemned us we're being placed upon this innocent sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the way Paul starts out chapter 8. Look at the last verses of chapter 8 in Romans, and this is what it says. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is, where is it? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. So in order to experience that love of God, connecting to that kind of love of God, we must be in Christ to experience it. And if we have it, if we're in Christ, there is absolutely nothing that will ever separate us from the love of God. 
He is the one who saves us. We do not save ourselves. So, in verse 30, it goes on to say this, that it is by his doing that we are in Christ Jesus. And what does Christ Jesus become to us uh, if we are in him? Who has become to us the wisdom from God, the righteousness from God, the sanctification from God, and the redemption from God. This is all wrapped up in his son, and those who trust in him and put their faith in him, all of a sudden they're saying, I've been looking for wisdom. Some of them may be intellectuals and trying to figure out a worldview of what you believe or philosophy in life, and all of a sudden all the wisdom of God is seen in the person of Christ. That he is the righteousness of God. That we cannot be righteous enough to save ourselves, but he is completely righteous. And so in his righteousness, we can stand before a righteous God. He is our sanctification. That means to be made holy. We can't make ourselves holy, but he has the power to make us holy. Set apart to God. He's our redemption. That's a slavery word. That means to be purchased out of bondage, to be bought out of slavery. Slavery to sin, slavery to Satan, slavery to hell. And we are purchased. So Christ becomes our redemption. He paid the price to get us out of slavery. Now, you might be saying, why did I say yes when someone that I know and someone that I love is continuing to say no? Why did I say yes to Christ and it happened in the basement of a Methodist church down in Texas when I was growing up and I have no idea what, what it was? Now I look back and it's a supernatural kind of thing where I had heard this all through Sunday school and then all of a sudden the preacher preached something about Jesus dying on the cross for my sins and I personalized it and I realized it was for me and I accepted him as my savior and in tears I responded to it and as a junior high I got on a bike and rode three miles home and I was singing overwhelmed with joy all the way. That is of his doing that it happened. So Why does one person say yes and another person say no? Is it because, well, I'm a little smarter than they are. Not quite so stupid. Or could we say, I'm stronger than they are. They're just weak. Or could we say, I'm nicer. Or I am of more noble birth. I was born into the right family. Therefore, I said yes. Is that the reason? No, it is by his doing, it is by his grace that we have accepted Christ and we are connected to Christ and we are in Christ and Christ becomes to us the wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, all gifts from God. Why? Why does God do it this way? Again, verse 31 ends it this way. So that just as it is written Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. There is no room for anybody to brag that something in us caused us to say yes apart from God changing us. So what seemed like foolishness and made no sense, all of a sudden, it's like he opened our eyes and said, whoa, I see it now. Or he unplugged our ears and we said, whoa, I hear it now. Or the heart that maybe had been stubborn and hard and resisting him and rebellion against him, all of a sudden our heart softens and saying, I want him now. That's the work of God. It's by his doing that he changes us that way. Now, stick with me here and uh, listen to what Edward said in his sermon. So much the more men exalt themselves, so much the less will they surely be disposed to exalt God. Man is naturally exceedingly prone 
to be exalting himself and depending on his own power and goodness. So you go to a funeral and they want to send a loved one to heaven and what they begin to do is try to list off all the good things that they've done and the kind of person that they are that's going to get them in good with God. We naturally tend to think that way. If I can just do enough good deeds to outweigh my bad deeds, God will smile on me. If I can, if in my heart I'm trying my best to do the right thing, even though I'm stumbling through it, I know God is going to be gracious and merciful and he's just going to let me in. Man is exceedingly prone to exalt himself and to depend upon his own goodness instead of depending upon a God-sent Savior. It is not by our doing. So Edwards went on, and this is what he, where he kind of lands it. This explains why salvation is by faith. For faith is the acknowledgement of absolute dependence upon God for salvation. Faith declares that man can do nothing and that God does everything. Faith abases men and exalts God. It gives all the glory of redemption to God alone. Humility is the great ingredient of true faith. He that truly receives redemption or freedom from sin receives it as a little child. Faith glorifies God alone, so God has programmed the whole salvation thing around those that will place their trust and total dependence upon him. God exalted in man's dependence. That's what Edwards was trying to say. What came to my mind today, uh, Abel, our youngest grandson here, Matthew and Dara's youngest, is celebrating his first spiritual birthday today. It was a year ago that he prayed with his mom and dad and trusted Christ to be his personal Savior. Now you think this is a child, but again, look what Edward says. Unless you become like a little child and humble yourself. But for several weeks before Abel prayed the prayer to want Christ to be his personal Savior, he kept praying this prayer. Jesus, please help me to become a Christian. Please help me to become a Christian. And there may be somebody here, and it's that kind of a prayer. Lord, I don't know why I struggle with this. I don't know why I'm stumbling over this. I don't know why sometimes I hear it and it sounds like foolishness to me. God, help my unbelief. Please, God, please help me to see it, to hear it, to want it. God, it's all of your doing. Have mercy on me. You pray that kind of prayer, and I believe that God will respond, and you will be one of those called, one of those chosen, one of those yellow legs dragged out from underneath a pile of railroad ties. Why does this kind of saving faith, where does it come from that saves us? Paul said it this way, Ephesians 2.8, For by grace unmeasured grace. You have been saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourselves, otherwise we could brag about it. It is a gift from God, a gift from God. John Piper had an interesting quote. Uh, God did not choose us because we will believe. Now, some people try to resolve this by saying, God looked down through the corridors of time saw that I was going to believe in his son, and therefore he chose me on the basis of seeing my, my faith way down the road. God did not choose us because we will believe. He chose us so that we will believe. It's all of God. It's all of God. So, There is no room for us to boast, absolutely no room for us to brag. It is by his doing, it is by his doing, 
You get this? It is by His doing that we are in Christ Jesus. We are saved by God's grace alone, and the faith that is required to be saved is a gift from God alone. And you might not like it, but that's what the Bible teaches. And so that's why we teach it and preach it here at Homestead. And all I can say is that uh, this picture, I think, captures it again. See that dog? That's the way we should be to God. Just grateful for his grace that he and his mercy drug us out of the dirt and transforms us by his love and changes us to become more like his son. And it's all of his doing so that all of the glory goes to God and not to man. When we went back to South Carolina uh, a year or so ago, we came to the tombstone of Rebecca Pickens, who was married to General Andrew Pickens, a Revolutionary War hero. And on her tombstone, she died before he died, to capture her life, humbly relying on the mercy of my Redeemer. You see the humility of that? There's no bragging in this. It is all sovereign grace and mercy that is demonstrated to those who do not deserve it. And as a result, God gets all the glory. All the glory. Deep within the dungeon, dark, all alone down in the dirt, a sad and single yellow leg. Is that you today? With his hand, son, reached to hold it. With a grip of grace and love, he pulled this pup into the light. Bony, scrawny, ugly mutt. Qualify. Tender hand now held his head, eyes to eyes and heart to heart, and through a smile the words were said. This is the one, Dad. This is the one, Heavenly Father. You granted, this is my dog, the chosen one. He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So all the glory goes to God. Now, are there mysteries tied to all this? Are there questions that you may wrestle with? Join the club. Everybody's been there or is there. But God, in his grace and mercy, saves us for his glory so that we can see the facets of his glory and his beauty. So, uh, Stan, won't you turn the lights down? Dara, I think you've got a song cued for us. We sang this song earlier, but now listen to the words of it and sing along if you want to. Uh, but it is unmeasured grace that God has granted to us. Yeah. 
may be. In Christ, you're being saved. Outside of Christ, you're perishing. But in your heart, you might say, you know, I really do want this. I've been stubborn. I've been rebellious. I've done things my own way. I've done a lot of stupid stuff. But the person that tries to claim they're good enough to get there is never going to make it. And the person that will bow down and be humble like a child, even if you have to pray like Abel prayed, dear Lord, make me a Christian. Please make me a Christian. Help me to believe. So, Maybe someone here right now that you just need to bow your head and pray a prayer. Say, Lord, I know that I have lived my life my own way and gone independent of you and tried to live without you and been stubborn at times. And sometimes when I've heard these things, I've not even wanted it. I just pray you'd have mercy on me. I want to accept your son as my savior. I want to trust in him and not try to trust in my own good works and good deeds. I just thank you so much that in your mercy you can drag me out of whatever you need to pull me out of in order to hold me and call me your own and that I can enjoy you forever. So, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you're raised from the dead. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, prayer is an expression of faith. So you pray. That's that's faith. That's expressing faith to God. And that's the way we're saved. And it's all by his doing. That we are connected to his son. Our eternal hope. So, Thank you all for coming. If you need to talk, if you want to pray with uh, Brock or me or Uh, somebody else maybe you know here, respect here, uh, please do that, but uh, you're dismissed. Thank you.